We are delighted that you're joining us. Um, I'm Deborah Gallant from e for all We're going to give everyone a few minutes to just get in and uh, get settled in our webinar meeting room. We will be using the chat function today to uh, interact with all of you. So if as you're coming on, you feel like you would like to tell us who you are and where you're coming from, that would be wonderful. We would love to hear from you. We always feel like it um, helps our energy to know that you're out there and you're interested in what we're talking about. So if you want to, uh, that would be great. Um, we're just going to wait for a moment or two before we get started. One thing um, anyone will tell you who knows me is I generally start on time and end on time or early. But today we'll definitely use our whole hour because there's so much to talk about. This is an unbelievably uh, interesting topic and uh, I'll actually be sharing, I don't know Shelly if you saw it, but I'll be sharing um, uh, an infographic that came from the state of Massachusetts about what reopening is going to look like. And it's hysterically funny because it's so useless. So we'll be talking about that as well. So um, a few housekeeping things. I'm Deborah Gallant from e for all in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. Um, I will be your facilitator and moderator today. Uh, Casey O'Donnell is our e for all Berkshire County program manager. Casey, turn from a light bulb to a face for just a minute so you can wave. There he is. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> He's our mountain man um, with, that, with that bushy beard. We all have hair issues. Um, and uh, we also have Donna Criscolo. Did I say it right? who's gonna help us with the centering exercise in a few minutes. And uh, Shelly and Lynn are our panelists. And we have one more panelist, we're hoping, there he is, Kevin is, is arriving right now. So I'm just gonna set us up and then we're gonna pass it off to Donna. Um, I think most of you who are gonna be on this uh, call or webinar uh, or watching the recording know what e for all is. But Entrepreneurship for All is a nonprofit organization that partners with communities nationwide to help under-resourced individuals successfully start and grow a business through intensive business training, mentorship, and an extended professional support network. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the webinars and what our thinking is with them. But um, e for all when we first launched these webinars said, let's do a little centering exercise. Uh, let's all be present and, and sort of gather together and, and get involved and stop answering our other emails and all the rest. And to do that, we are bringing in a guest. So Donna is the executive director, my colleague from the South Coast. She is a wellness person, a yoga instructor, and way more qualified to do this centering than I am. So Donna, why don't you take it for a moment or two and then I'll grab it back. Thanks, Deborah. So um, we're doing this, um, the centering, because when we initially started these webinars, it was right at the beginning of the crisis and so many people were in panic mode. And since we take a holistic approach to how we work with entrepreneurs, we thought this was a natural uh, addition to these very valuable webinars that Deborah and um, Casey are hosting. So we just want to acknowledge the fact that we are in a crisis, that we are, there's a lot that's unknown. And when we're in the unknown, we tend to react out of fear. And the way to combat fear is to be in the present moment. So we're just going to take a couple of moments here to ground and center and create a presence for ourselves so that you can take in the information and move throughout the rest of your day with some ease of mind. So for those of you who are sitting, just make sure you're sitting fully in your seat. Use the back of your chair to lean into. Make sure you're sitting in your sit bones. Those are the knobs at the base of your pelvis. They help to move your pelvic bowl upright so that your spine can easily lean in and um, balance on top of your sacrum. And then we all have our shoulders up near our ears most of the time because we're in tension. So just let your shoulders drop and relax. Allow your arms to be heavy. They could hang by your side or you can have your hands in your lap. Allow your belly to soften. And just let all that tension in your body go. And then if you haven't already, just close your eyes. And let's take a nice inhale through your nose and let the breath go all the way in 
to your belly, to the base of your belly. And as you exhale, let the breath come from the base of your belly all the way up out through your nose in a slow and steady stream. And again, taking a nice, long, slow inhale, filling fully and completely. And at the end of that inhale, allow the exhale to move slow and steady and smoothly, exhaling any tension, any worries. And then one more nice deep inhale. Let your belly expand fully, taking in all of that air and oxygen, nutrients for every cell of your body. And on this exhale, allow all of the tension in your body to release. And when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes and Deborah, I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, I feel so much more centered after you do that. It's great, thank you. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background on what we have in mind here. So back when this started, and, and believe it or not, you guys, this is week eight, and I have week nine already set up, um, getting ready for what we'll be talking about next Wednesday. But the idea was that with all of us in our different places, it was hard to figure out how to feel supported and and continue with your business. And we have mostly stayed away from subjects about like the PPP loans and the EIDLs. And we did a little bit of that. We really wanna focus on how do you keep thinking about your business in a positive way and keep the momentum going. So we've, we've been scheduling them one week at a time, only trying to sort of plug into what people are thinking and talking about on a weekly basis. And um, this week, the, the topic is what will gathering look like in a post-COVID world? When, when I wrote the topic, which was about a week ago, I saw something on Facebook. And it's like, is that what our new world is going to look like? And it sort of spurred this thought of what is gathering going to look like? So the format of what we're going to do today is I have three terrific uh, panelists and they're each going to talk what their world is, what their world was pre-COVID, what they're seeing now, and maybe just a little bit about what they're doing to think about this whole gathering thing. And then we're gonna hopefully engage in an interesting dialogue and I encourage you to um, uh, enter your questions in the chat box. We even have been known to, if you want to ask your own question, unmute you and bring you into the conversation. Um, so if you have something you want, one of these people has a crystal ball or is the governor of their state. We can't say today what's going to happen. Nobody knows. This is just a big, I don't know, unknown it's there's no rule book here but i thought from these three folks and the different points of view that they have about what it is to gather in one place um, and bring people together that we would get some insight so without further ado i'm going to introduce our first guest is lynn kennedy lynn was a referral from our uh, friends at holyoke e for all holyoke she um, is the sales manager, I believe, for a place called Log Cabin. She'll tell you a little bit more about it, but it's all about the hospitality industry. It's a restaurant, it's an event space, it's a hotel, and wow, things must have really hit you guys pretty hard. So Lynn, you're on for a few minutes. Fantastic, thank you for having me. Um, so yes, I'm the director of sales and marketing for the Log Cabin Delaney House and D Hotel and Suites. We are a a uh, full service venue out in Western Massachusetts doing events uh, from the size of one person all the way up to 700 people. Um, and we have a 61 room hotel. So uh, we, you know, are in the crux of wedding season at this moment. We are really starting to move very quickly into the wedding season. Um, we are, when this all began, it was not wedding season, which was our, uh, probably our highlight at the time. We thought, okay, this is great. We can get through this before we really start, um, 
hitting the ground running with our brides because that's one of we do over 200 weddings a year and the majority of them happen between the may through um through october time frame uh, between our two facilities so we were hoping that as, as march 17th rolled around we were going to be okay and not really hit too hard with the brides um, for all of us, that has obviously changed and evolved, and uh, every week is different for us. Every week, how we address this and handle this has changed and evolved for us. Our first week, um, we really felt like, okay, so the gathering business will stop for the time being, but our restaurant will still stay functional. Um, we'll still be able to have people in and dine at our two restaurants, and the hotel will stay operational. Uh, then about two, but actually the first week, that changed. We made the decision. Uh, the governor in Massachusetts closed all restaurants and had us move to takeout and pickup services. We as an establishment decided that that was not a good move for us because of where we're located. We don't have a very strong takeout business. So our restaurant had to close completely and we pushed all of our services for takeout to three markets that we operate called Delaney's Markets and they're basically take home meals. Um, so we pushed all our business in that direction. We closed our restaurants, we closed our banquet facilities, um, and we went from 300 person staff down to 30 people in a matter of days. Um, so it was a very, very huge change for us. Um, and we all began the process of working remotely. Um, then as this progressed on, we started to have to deal with our weddings and our large businesses that were planning on having 300 person events or 100 person events and that obviously wasn't going to happen. Um, so we had to start looking at navigating how we were going to move all of these weddings essentially or all of these events from 2020 to 2021. What we chose to do with our clients um, might not be the same as what other venues do. We pride ourselves in customer service. So we took the customer service approach and we um, basically said to our clients that if you booked with us this year, you had money down with us, you had deposits, you had paid for your wedding, we will move all of that to a new date for you um, that, that we now have available for the next year. So we, at this point, have moved about 27 weddings, 27 of our 200 weddings to 2021 or later of 2020. Um, we have some that are still holding out hope. We have backup dates resolved for some people who, do, who wanna keep their current dates but wanna have a new date on backup just in case. So it's a very different norm for us. Um, Lynn, right do, you have, do you have a date that you've set that you have to cancel or reschedule if you're through a specific date or you're just letting the brides decide? We, we had at the very beginning, we had decided that we were going to let people, ideally we were asking them for two, two weeks prior to make that decision for um, of what they were going to do, two weeks prior to the date. Um, and that was mainly for food ordering purposes, so that we had enough time for food ordering purposes. Um, as we've closed our business, we really have not, we've tried to stay within a two month window. So we've tried to stay, deal with, while we were in March, really dealing with only brides that were happening in May and June. And then now we're in May, we're looking at brides that are happening now all the way out into August. So we're trying to kind of stay within a two month window, just so we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, but we are, as of this week, starting to see our fall brides now coming to us and asking for backup dates and uh, reschedules. We're really moving towards backup dates first, putting people in a backup date and keeping their original date before we actually move them. Great. Is there anything else you want to add before I pass it off? Um, I think the only thing I want to add is that another big focus that we've had this week is that we, you know, potentially could be opening our restaurant um, in the next 10 days. We don't really know what that looks like. So we've had a lot of focus on how that changes our, um, how our facility is going to accommodate potential in-house dining. And for us, we're taking an approach of we have the ability to dine outside. And so that will most likely be our first step is that we will open up outdoor dining before we open up actually, regardless of what the governor tells us we can do, um, we are kind of taking the approach that what's best for our facility versus what's in our area versus what's best. So even though the governor says, okay, you can open up your doors on Mondays, we most likely will not be opening them on Monday. We most likely will be delaying um, to what we feel comfortable with. 
Well, I hope Mother Nature uh, cooperates with you because I can tell you here in the Berkshires it was 43 degrees yesterday, so no one's yeah. eating outside. But we're going into a warm stretch. Uh, today is our last cool day, and then we go into like a 70 and 80 degree stretch. So I'm really looking forward to that and hoping that stays with us. <laughs> Great, thank you, Lynn. You're um, welcome. Kevin, I'm going to go to you now, and I'm glad you got your camera working with your beautiful lilacs. You're obviously somewhere warmer than the Berkshires. Um, I'm going to let you tell your own bio. I know you run Venture Cafe. You're our e for all Roxbury uh, landlord, right? Our, we work out of a co-working space, at least when that's open. But I think it, you bring a, a different perspective on gathering because you have a different kind of business. So why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, so I'm Kevin Wyatt. Uh, up until last week, I was the executive director for Venture Cafe New England. And I've just left to go work on the, the uh, election 2020 campaign. But for the last over seven years, I've been running the growth of Venture Cafe and our programs and spaces around Cambridge, Boston, and now down in Providence. Uh, we run four different locations, of which uh, some of it is from our own programming, and some of it's for hosting meetings and programs for other organizations. And then a couple of our locations also have an um, open workspace, lounge space to work out of. Uh, we do it all under the context of it's uh, helping people, anybody with an idea to get the resources that they need to start and launch a successful business. It could be a high tech startup or a food startup, a retailer or a wide range of businesses. Uh, we started in Cambridge um, 10 years ago and then moved to Boston for District Hall down in Boston, the Seaport area since 2013. Been operating in Roxbury in the Dudley Square area and the bowling building since 2015. And then we just opened up down Providence um, with the space and programming track in the new Dyer Street building at the .225 building down in the 195 area. Uh, as Deborah mentioned, uh, one of the partnerships that we have is with E4ALL. Uh, so E4ALL was hosting their sessions in our Roxbury space. And it's been a great partnership, which we launched last year. It was off to a good fall. We were looking forward to good to 2020 before COVID hit. Uh, so we're all adjusting to our plans. But it's been a great partnership and we've really enjoyed working with them. Uh, on the transition part of it, what we've done on our own programming is shifting it uh, all to the digital. Uh, when COVID started to ramp up, that includes our regular Thursday night program, which we run weekly in Cambridge and Providence, as well as our workshops, clinics, and seminars, and one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, uh, which we hold at all four of our locations. Uh, the space-wise, uh, we did shut down all of our spaces for meetings, as well as for uh, people working in the lounges at the time that the state declared an emergency, state of emergency, so we closed everything down. Uh, we had had some few people starting to cancel or reschedule at that point. And then of course the pace has picked up to that time. Uh, we have been offering people who had meetings and programs scheduled in our spaces, which range anything from like a eight person conference room up to a 200 per person room. Uh, we're starting to reschedule out. We've offered them the opportunity to reschedule out by six months. And many of them have taken that option versus cancel. We've had a few people cancel it out, but most people are hopeful that they'll do something later in the year. And I think everybody's waiting to see what the, the governors of Massachusetts does uh, for next week. And then Rhode Island has issued their first round, first phase criteria. And we've got some small gatherings beginning to be planned down in, in Providence. Our, our own approach for what we think it might be happening in the future is uh, probably twofold or maybe threefold. There's probably what happens in phase one, phase two, which is the ramp up phase for both the Massachusetts and Rhode Island, Massachusetts TBD, but the governor did show some uh, preview of that on Monday. Uh, then there's phase three, where you start getting closer to be to, to the new normal might be. And then I think phase four is when a vaccine's actually available and people are more comfortable coming out and being doing something in a larger group. Uh, so when we do opening, based upon whatever criteria is established by Massachusetts, uh, we will be having like, a very clean facilities, uh, we're expecting only to be having smaller meetings being able to happen, and we'll be supportive of that. And uh, then what we expect in phase two, it might be larger gatherings uh, with a little bit less, less restrictions as far as seating capacity for it. And then we'll see what the criteria is in phase three. 
Uh, we also have a restaurant partner, which is in our, our district called Boston location. Uh, we're working closely with them because they provide the catering with us. So we're all anxiously waiting for the criteria to come out. Uh, we do think that in programming wise, there'll be a mix of both in-person as digital uh, connections or combinations. Uh, so we're looking at enabling our conference room to be able to support that. Obviously, we've got great uh, high-speed Wi-Fi, but making sure that cameras can be plugged in easily to make that available to them. And um, we'll also look at what they might require as far as temperature checks in the building and checking people in and whether that's covered by the, the meeting organizer or by our, some staff that we might have to provide. So uh, there's, we're uh, making some adaptions al already. Uh, the video program has gone very well, so the conversations continue. Uh, some people are definitely engaged with the program that we have across the board. And then we're waiting anxiously to see what Massachusetts has done. And then we'll wait to see what phase two looks like for Rhode Island. It's phase one's relatively pretty still restrictive. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I have a bunch of follow-up questions, which I'll get to, but actually I love this transition from you to Shelly. Shelly Carduz is the director of programs for EFRAL. So, you know, you guys are partners and also we're doing some similar things in terms of EFRAL trying to support new businesses. And I, and I think that this question of how virtual works and how in-person works is the kind of thing that Shelly is grappling with every day as EFRAL moves its programs forward despite the lack of ability to gather in person. So Shelly, I'm gonna let you take it for a few minutes and then we'll bring up some questions and dialogue. All right, great. You know, it's pretty wild to think back to, I remember early May, we had a meeting, our executive team at for all and our CEO um, said to me, Shelly, how will you handle it if um, people aren't able to meet in person anymore? And I remember my, you know, I was like, well, I can't answer that. In five minutes, this would take a lot of work. We'd have to really think it through. And it's crazy how then rapid it all started to shift, where that next week it was like, let's kind of look at this as if it's the weather, to quickly saying, you know, we, we pretty early on said we're not doing any large events anymore, anything over maybe 40 people. We started to brainstorm how to do smaller events. And by the end of that next week, we had all of our staff working from home and started thinking through what it all looked like. Um, one thing that e for all as an accelerator program to support entrepreneurs, we, we see other accelerators around the country and a, a lot of them have a virtual experience already. But one thing that we have always said is something that makes us different is that we are all about in-person classes, in-person mentor meetings, and that has been something that has been unique to us. So, um, you know, it, we, we definitely learned pretty quickly how to, how to adapt some of our events, but then we had to start and the other thing is our focus has been so much on um, entrepreneurs that are starting businesses, but we all started to feel the need of businesses in our community that needed help, alumni that needed help. So we started to, you know, switch gears a little bit to do a little bit more of that business support. And at the time, we weren't even sure, are people really trying to start businesses now in such a crazy time? Um, so certainly, you know, we're in hustle mode, but also that uncertain mode. Uh, we have since then found that uh, we have a summer accelerator that we've had applications coming in and the demand for people wanting to start a business or get to the next level is, is big right now. And we at one point just had to make the decision when planning ahead at our, our accelerator being the next three months in person, well, should have been in person <laughs> in classes and then events, at first, we were saying, well, it's going to start virtual. Well, maybe part of it will be virtual. And eventually, we just said, we just have to make this decision because there's too much up in the air. You know, you have somebody that maybe they could mentor if it was virtual, but couldn't if it was in person or one way or the other. And, you know, it's interesting, Kevin, how you say setting up some of the rooms so that both can work. I've been in situations where you have some people that are physically in a room and some that aren't, and it's just a difficult thing. So at a certain point, we just had to say, listen, we have to set the expectation for the entrepreneurs, for the volunteers, and for our staff to just say whether, you know, even if you, even if in July, we feel like we can all go back out into the world, um, you know, we just, we just need to, to set it. So we've been working hard and figuring out what that experience is, how people can still connect, how people can still get to know each other. Um, and you know, I, I get asked all the time, what, what, what about September? What about this? And at a certain point, I think, you know, even on a personal note outside of work, I'm all about 
socializing, live entertainment, all of this stuff. And I've had to come to this point of you just can't plan ahead for all these things. Like we really, really more than ever have to take it one day at a time. Um, and when planning ahead, when we'll talk more about that, but um, thinking about what can, what can shift and, and still, you know, not be affected by it. Great. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I want to remind our audience, uh, we thank you so much for being here. We are recording today and we encourage your questions. So just put them in the chat box or raise that hand feature. I'm actually going to ask Kevin to unmute himself because I think Shelley and Kevin should have a, a conversation about can you have an effective meeting with some people in the room and some on video or on the phone. I think I think I agree with Shelly that you, you need to be all in or all out and it's very hard to do both. Kevin, yeah, what do you I think? think? I think we're in a new norm. Um, so I think uh, people now have adapted to the video area. Uh, we've, we've all been about, I know I've been on a lot of different Zoom type of, Zoom, Remo, Google Hangout, you know, Microsoft type of meetings for it, and people are definitely learning how to use the tool because they've had to. Uh, so in the past, I think we all preferred to be there in person. Uh, it's the preference, preferable way of doing it. I understand there's some issues with the video uh, connections of people not being in the room. I think people have definitely adapted to that mode. And I think in the mode that we are going forward that we won't be able to get as many people in a room as we would like, that becomes something that we I think we have to continue to adapt to that we have to be able to have the right etiquette and approaches so we can help support people on a video connection. But I, I was I just guess... reading, like, just reading this morning, like, you know, things like IDG, you now with their corporate headquarters, is now re redoing their corporate headquarters design, so it's people only be stopping in when they need to versus having an office all the time. I think a lot of the larger companies are beginning to adapt to the same thing. Twitter just announced earlier today. That I heard that. To Jack Dorsey people... said everyone's going to work virtually if they want to. But I, I guess my question is, yeah. Is there a way as as people who are facilitating gatherings to make it work? I, it feels hard. If I had a person sitting next to me and then I was on with you guys with video, it feels confusing. <laughs> yeah, it depends, I think it's based upon what type of event you're looking at. Things like workshops and clinics and seminars are a bit easier. Uh, if you get into like more of a networking environment, you know, there's been a really good tool we've been working with, which is Remo for an all digital experience. And we're trying to figure out how you might that make that into a, a mixed environment. We get some thoughts so far, but we haven't obviously rolled them out to play with them yet. But I think that we have to continue to experiment to see what might work and what might not work. And and if I don't want to put words in Shelley's mouth, but I, yeah. I think the E for all decision was let's just go virtual. Everyone will know that the uh, assuredness, the knowing what it's gonna be and that it's virtual just made it easier to proceed. Is is that correct, Shelley? Yeah, and part of it is thinking ahead of when, like who makes the call and when do you make the call. So the governor and the local, part of what's happening too is you need to focus on what's happening, what's being dictated nationally, what's being dictated by the state, but also what's being dictated in your own city. And then we work out of different spaces. So like we're talking about in Roxbury, being at the Roxbury Innovation Center, in New Bedford, we're out of the groundwork co-working space. So it's not just us at E4 all saying, okay, I think we're okay. Um, then it's is everybody comfortable? Is child is daycare and childcare back? Um, if what I thought was going to be complicated if we just kept it open as let's start a virtual and see what happens is, you know, you may be having classes virtually or and then in person and then an event comes up and you're like, well, how many people are coming to that? Like, it just seems so hard to shift that it is it just better. And Kevin, I know what, you're, what you mean by the half virtual, half not. I think it depends what it is. I know in my experience, there have been times that I've taken the two hour drive to our headquarters just to not be the one person that's on the phone when everybody else is in the room because some conversations are just, it's like easier if everybody's on video or if nobody is. <laughs> Sometimes that like being that one person out can be, can be tricky. Um, I actually would be fascinated. I know that some of the people who are, are on w watching us have been participants in our accelerators, kind of what their feeling is about the ability to impart all of this and create the camaraderie in the cohort as well when they can't be in person. But I actually am going to take control for a moment and just share a screen to start the conversation because I think this is hysterical. This is 
what was released by the state of Massachusetts. Can you guys see this? The four phase approach to reopening Massachusetts. Um, it is without a doubt the biggest piece of useless infographic I've ever seen because it says nothing. Current state, stay at home. Limited industries resume operations with severe restrictions. That's phase one. That's what Lynn's going to have on Monday, right? She can open, but like, what does that look like? Phase two, cautious. Additional industries resume operations with restrictions and capacity limits. Phase three, vigilant. <laughs> Additional industries resume operations. The reason it looks like this, people, is because no one knows what this is going to look like. This is really wildly unknown. Um, I'd be interested, Lynn, to, to think about for you, who you've literally had your door shut all 270 of your employees laid off. How do you even take that kind of guidance from the state and know what to do on Monday? Uh, it's probably been one of our toughest challenges over the last week, and especially because we don't actually know 100% if we are part of phase one. We are, uh, we have heard rumors that we are part of phase one, but we do not know that 100% yet. We may not know that until May 18th. So everything we are planning is all hearsay at this point. It's all in preparation that we potentially could get the go-ahead on the 18th. Um, so what we, what we have been doing is basically kind of with an approach, uh, we're looking at what does our event schedule look like? How many staff do we need to support if any of these events hold? We're also I'm constantly reporting on, okay, this is what's in the system, but the likelihood, creating scenarios of the likelihood of anything holding. We've had a couple of events who've asked us, hey, we wanna go to virtual, but we still want to come into your, uh, your space for like 10 of us to actually be physically there to have the event and then have everybody else as a virtual option. Um, so there's a lot of different scenarios that we have to play out. From the restaurant side of things, you know, we don't, we don't even have the numbers of our capacity yet. So that, this is one of our biggest factors from the restaurant standpoint is our restaurant can hold 100 people. And, and I'm using a, an easy number here. But if we're told that our capacity can only be 25%, that means we have to look at how are we seating 25 people and making that work. A um, couple of shifts that we definitely know that we are making. We're going to reservation only so that we can limit the amount of people who are congregating at the front of our restaurant. So we'll be a, a reservation only restaurant for the immediate future. We've eliminated any buffet options from any of our menus so that there's not really, or we're, we're discouraging, I should say, um, any of our clients to choose any type of buffet menus or if they've gotten any they've chose any, that we are switching them to a plated option. Um, we are known for a signature brunch that we do every Sunday morning that will not be happening um, most likely until the fall. So um, it's, it, there's a lot of things that we are already adjusting. We're limiting menus. We're not gonna run with a full menu because it doesn't make sense because we don't know what our capacity is going to be. So we'll have limited drink menu, limited food menu, limited beer, everything will be in the limited capacity. Lynn, do you get to the point? Lynn, do you get to the point? And I'm interested in hearing from Shelley and Kevin, who probably are in touch with lots of small businesses. Is there a point at which it doesn't even make sense to open up? I mean, if you can only seat 25 percent of the number of people for your dining room, how do you figure out the economics of that? Yeah, so that is something we are very much in tune to, and it's one of the reasons we decided to close our doors versus being takeout and, um, you know, being a takeout curbside pickup location, because it was not financially responsible for us to keep our doors open and run in that capacity. And it may not be financially responsible for us to do the same at, um, at, the, at, the, at the capacity of 25%. We can't make that decision until we know what that capacity is. Um, because we know what it takes to run our facility. We know how much money we need to bring in every day in order for it to make sense for our facility to be open. Um, and we have an idea of the cost that people, the, the, the average ticket that people spend within our doors um, when they do come in. So it gives us 
you know, a good idea, a good run of whether that, once we have that mark, whether it makes sense for us to actually go. And that's why we're not rushing. We're not rushing to the point where we're saying, okay, if the governor says May 18th is go, that not, may not be the smartest decision for us. Um, so we are constantly weighing all of those factors right now. Um, and I will tell you that, that it's not just our restaurant. Our owner is in continual conversation with multiple different restaurants um, in the area who run multiple, you know, more than one. Um, and they all are kind of working together to make decisions together as groups that make sense for their individual restaurants. Um, I'm interested, Shelly and Kevin, because you guys are in touch with lots of these smaller business startups. Is this going to fundamentally change the economics of, of what they're doing and how many people can be in one place at one time? Might make it actually not feasible to start or, or maintain a certain kind of business. Yeah, I think it will. I think this is something that a lot of people are waiting for to see what the restrictions are. And you can decide what works for your particular business. I mean, it, it could well be back in phase one that it's too restrictive for some businesses to actually open up. So they wait to a later phase where they can actually potentially get enough revenue to support the costs which they need to actually operate. And then we're all familiar with the concept of this variable costs, but there's fixed costs. And so you want to be able to cover at least your variable costs and contribute something back to fixed if you can. But you also like, find a way for your employees to be working on a rather regular basis. Uh, so it's a decision that, that we have to face and that all of our people that we help through our programs is to face the same factor. Like when does it make sense to get back into business depending upon what the business is, particularly if it's an in-person type of business. If it's online, a bit easier. If it's on, on in person, then you've really got to look at what's smart for what's being uh, given as guidelines by the state, by your local city and government. For example, we suspect in Boston would be a different criteria that might, might be happening in Holyoke across the state. Or then what's, what's smart for your individual business and your team. Shelley, do you see anything different or, you know, what kind of guidance are you, are you giving people? You know, I think it's so case by case. I think um, for some businesses, they just need to shift how they've been doing things. And, you know, I feel like you kind of have to take out every element of it and look at it. Um, for some people, I don't think it's going to be worth it to open at 25% capacity. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, you could say, okay, well, you're paying less staff, but what about the overhead of just running? Um, We've seen people do some clever things. I mean, some, some pop-up stuff and getting online, but I, I think it's really evaluating what it is that you can offer in a healthy, safe way. That's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of dissecting it. I was talking to somebody yesterday that works in retail and they were saying they work in high-end retail and they do like custom tailoring. And he was saying like, even with a mask on, I can't imagine that I'm like gonna get on people, somebody's neck. And I was like, yeah, you're not gonna do that anymore. You're not going to do it. Like, even though that's, that's a great thing, maybe maybe you come up with a clever way that you give somebody else the measurement and, and you still make it an experience. But there there are certain things that we're just going to have to, to tweak when it comes to that. Yeah, I was actually thinking about the act of going in for a haircut, right? So there's three or four stylists in the salon, three or four customers. Um, it's literally close contact, right? They got to cut my hair. They got to shampoo my hair. Will they get rid of some of that? Will I wait in, in my car instead of in a waiting room? Will they sanitize between people? I think that there's a lot of this that needs to be worked out. And I don't know, I'm, I might rather have my hair cutter come and sit on my sun porch and cut me outside at my own house and pay the premium for her to not make me go to her place than do it. I don't know, but I think that this is a time when um, if you're delivering an in-person business, you have to think about uh, how are people going to react to that? I will say one positive thing is because I am home all the time now, um, I buy all of my food from the farmer's market that delivers. We have an entrepreneur that came through the program that does um, made meals that delivers. We have a local organic shop that I can get my produce at. And that's ideally how I would operate. But in my normal life of traveling for work and, and um, going to events, Normally I'm at Shaw's at 11 p.m. And um, nothing against Shaw's. I mean, it's nice to have a grocery store down the street, but it feels great to be able to purchase local vegetables, local meat. And I do think that that is a, is a huge positive of this is people really looking towards to the businesses in their, in their neighborhood. 
Um, I'm going to shift a little bit unless any of the rest of you want to comment on anything up to now or we, I, I see one thing from Mindy that I think is worth checking in on is that here in Western Massachusetts, some of our towns, literally people are getting Wi-Fi by driving up to the library and sitting in the parking lot because there is not reliable high speed internet everywhere. So the shift to doing everything virtually does exclude some people who really don't have that access. They can only do it in the library parking lot. So thank you for sharing that, Mindy. But I want to go to the question of where do you get your guidance? So Lynn said that the owner of your restaurant talks to other owners of your restaurant, but I assume that there's a restaurant association or somebody like that. Where do you get your guidance and, and guidelines about sanitation and distancing and opening mm -hmm. and whether you're even on this list? Because somebody must know, right? So for us, we are members of the Massachusetts Restaurant Association, and um, that is part of this larger conversation that we are having. Um, I will tell you that the guidance that we're getting from them, though, is uh, very tight-lipped right now because they are fearful to say something that is inaccurate and for it to get out to the masses. So um, I think you know, our biggest problem right now is that people assume because we are in the event industry or the restaurant industry that we are getting a heads up before everybody else when this stuff is going to happen. And that is not the case. We are waiting on bated breath. Um, I will tell you, I, I, there was a week we went by where my entire team, we were texting every day, what time does the governor speak? Um, because we all wanted to be paying attention because we were waiting to see if this extension was going to happen. Um, so this was the last round about two weeks ago. And um, our clients are under the assumption that we literally are texting with Governor Baker and getting answers right away. And we're just, that's just not the case. We are waiting just like everybody else. We get the information um, just like everybody else when it is announced. The Massachusetts Restaurant Association has helped us in a sense of giving us an idea of what things we need to change in the restaurant um, and even in the banquet facility. For example, uh, we have to look at the way that we actually distribute silverware. Silverware cannot sit on a table anymore. Um, so you can't have like preset, um, they're, they're there's discussions about everything has to be in roll-ups and protected versus being sat on, sat on tables whether that's 100% confirmed at this point or not, these are conversations. They're talking about um, different styles of menus because people don't want to be handed an individual menu, so it has to be a disposable menu now, or um, creating QR codes where people can actually view the menus online. So all of these different kind of states, situations that we have to take, we're getting some guidance from the Massachusetts Restaurant Association on that side of things, but everything else, we are waiting for the governor. And then once something comes out and we're not clear, we go back to the Massachusetts Restaurant Association and say, this doesn't make sense. Can you clarify? And it's then their responsibility to do that for us. But that's basically our only guidance at this point. Kevin, where are you, where are you getting your information and guidance from? All right, Mary, I also lost the audio for a couple of minutes. So information wise, the question is like, where am I getting my information from? Um, I'm kind of a news briefing junkie, uh, so I watch a lot of the briefings, uh, particularly Governor Cuomo out of New York, just to see how they're approaching it. I think they're setting up sort of a standard that parts of New England would pick up, maybe not exactly the same model, but similar one. Uh, watch the White House, White House briefings to see how they're going, and I actually used to watch them on C-SPAN all the way through to get all the information, not just the excerpts you got from, from CNN. Uh, Governor Baker's briefings, uh, Gina, Gina, uh, Gina Raimondo's briefings out of Rhode Island as best I can. They move around a bit. Uh, I'm on several email newsletters from like the SBA uh, for the convention center, both in Providence as well as in Boston, watching what they're thinking and saying, uh, talking to a lot of folks, uh, particularly in the kind of the co-working space environment in Boston and Cambridge about how they're approaching it. Uh, for how to handle people as well as how to adapt the facilities. Uh, so those are the many sources I try to comprehend each day. Well, and I think that what's interesting is that there there's not a lot of detail. It's like that PPP loan. It's like they announced it without figuring out all of the back end of it. And I think some of this May 18th thing is a little bit smoke and mirrors. And they the people, the bureaucrats who are deciding it haven't decided it yet. 
I mean, I don't know if that's a fair thing to say. Where are you getting your info from, Shelly? From me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just called Deborah. <laughs> you know, I mean, at the, at the beginning of this, I read every single article, watched every press conference. I mean, besides being in Massachusetts, we're also in Colorado. So I would read what was going on in both states. But again, things would then be different by city. At a certain point, I was like, I can't, I can't read every single thing anymore. Um, but it's, it's kind of a mix. I, again, I think it's important to see what's going on in our local communities, but I also think we need to see the trends that are happening um, through all the states in the world. Um, and, you know, we do have some other accelerator programs we can talk to. I think part of it too is, you know, say you're, you're going to, you're going to do a virtual event. You should attend somebody else's. You know, there's a lot going on right now where we can learn from each other. What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? You know, I know, Mindy, you were talking about um, some of the internet issues and even Kevin, you saying the audio. Like, I finally, it took me a while of being on these Zoom calls and missing the connection until I realized, wait, I can actually hook my phone audio to it. So some of this is a learning process for all of us and just seeing what works, what doesn't work. I wish I had a solid answer for that, Deborah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I definitely, just being a resident of my city, I, I do follow the local news and what the mayor's saying. I do try to keep up with what the governor's saying. Um, and then as far as different industries, I think, like Lynn is saying, any type of association that knows about that, you know, I think in retail, there are retail associations, and it's good to just to really follow along with that. Great. Thank you. Kevin, I'm going to um, pick on you for a minute because I just think it's really interesting that you have set aside the Venture Cafe to work on the election. Are we going to be gathering for election rallies? Are you guys planning uh, to help candidates through virtual meetings? What? How do you think about that right now? Well, just, just getting it started that transition over to helping out the elections. So I don't have a lot of insights. Uh, I know what's happening. So not right now is a lot of the digital connections in many different formats and they're all again waiting to see how the the how things progress with, with the virus in different states about how they might do in-person things later in the year but there's not a lot of set planning yet there's a lot of scenario discussion about what might happen based upon what the, the governors and the the mayor is the municipal mayor to decide to do, and then I think the virus does. I think that's just all kind of wait mode. But now it's a heavy digital activity. Kevin, your your audio is a little bit choppy, but um, yeah, I heard a lot of scenario planning. I actually want to share that my daughter works for a nonprofit in D.C., and they have actually done scenario planning as if people will not meet in person for a year, and what will that do to their organization? And I thought wow that has it's a little bit doomsday but maybe that's the kind of scenario planning we all need to be thinking about because um the next thing i want to ask is just as individuals shelly has as uh shared on a couple of the program calls at you for all her friends all call her like shelly should we buy concert tickets for this concert at the end of the year and it's like i don't know how i feel like i have tanglewood tickets to hear james taylor on the fourth of july and Actually, they haven't even announced if that concert is going to happen or not. I would hate to give them up, but I might not be able to go. I, don't, I just don't know if I'll be able to get it. How do you personally feel about leaving your house and going to these things, even when the governor gives you permission? Shelly, I'm starting with you. You know, I think early on in all of this, I mean, you know, and I was thinking early on, like, okay, let's just plan ahead a week. Let's plan ahead two weeks. And I think a lot of stuff has been given to us in this two week chunk of like schools canceled for two weeks. And then this, and even as May 18th approaches, I was like, Oh, I just assumed that was going to be pushed back. And, you know, even though people are thinking May 18th is when things open up, as we know, there's no guidelines. So it's not really opening for me personally. I've really had to shift. I mean, I had plenty, I had a few trips planned that I've had to cancel. And to be honest, it's hard for me, but I don't, I don't, I just don't plan on really, going to any big um, events anytime soon. I think um, even if today I, I could, no, I, I would definitely phase it out. I mean, I have family that I, I want to see. I think it's really important for me to be able to see my mother. So I don't, you know, I just try to be very careful. I also, to be honest, 
I don't like wearing a mask for a long time. I don't either. So I was saying to a friend the other day, she was like, you know, at some point you think we'll be able to ride in cars together. I still lately, if I'm going to go for a long ride or any ride, I'm like, oh, who should I call? I still think that. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, wait, no, I have to go alone. And I hate to say because I love my friends. I'd love to have a companion. But if I was in the car an hour and a half wearing a mask to have somebody in it, I think I may say I'll just talk to you on the phone. I'd rather not have it on all the time. So I think sometimes I avoid going to things for that reason. Uh, I think that's wise. Lynn, how about, how do you feel personally? Uh, for me personally, I am not anticipating uh, really having anything large to go to over the next, uh, I don't think it's going to be a decision that I personally will have to make because I think it's going to be made for us, to be honest with you. I think the limitations are going to stay small for quite some time. Uh, I personally, my daughter will not be going to any camps this summer. She will be home. I'm anticipating that my husband's not going to be teaching summer school. He will be home. And so our summer will be spent at home. There will be no vacation. There will be no getaway this summer like there normally is. Um, so I've kind of in that mindset right now of I'm not really anticipating that there's going to be a lot of, as much as I'm dying, I'm a very social person. I want so badly to see people and hang out with people. Um, and have even my husband's like, when this is all over, we're having an end of quarantine, huge barbecue in our backyard. <laughs> and uh, that's probably not going to happen for quite some time in, in my- Well, like, how do you know when that is, right? The day that they exactly. announce the vaccine? Yeah. No, I, yeah. We haven't, you know, for us personally, for me personally, we haven't even talked about what that looks like for us and how, how we feel about it. Um, for us, we're, we've been overly, we are a very cautious family. It could very much, I personally do not want to expose myself any more than I have to, um, nor does my husband. And I will tell you, going to the grocery store, I went to the grocery store for the first time um, about two weeks ago. My husband has really been doing that, uh, or we've been delivering it in. Um, and I had some anxiety. I'm not going to lie. I actually wasn't sure if I was following the right protocols am I too, oh, I'm too close to these people. It, it, so it was almost too much. It, it, it was like, why is, what's the point? This is too overwhelming for me. I don't feel like I'm doing the right things. Um, and so for me, it was easier to just stay home. <laughs> and well, uh, I also yeah. think as people who are the conveners, right? We're the people who gather other people together. What for an yeah. for all event, inviting you to a restaurant. Yeah you don't want to be the one responsible for, for making people sick. I mean, I don't, did you guys hear about this guy in South Korea after things started to open up and there were nightclubs, one 29 year old guy has infected at least 80 other people who've tested positive and he was asymptomatic. It's because um, he was so eager to get out there. He just put his face in a dangerous place. I wouldn't want to be that nightclub owner who said, I thought this was safe enough. So I think we take on extra responsibility as the conveners. Um, Ayana's talking about wellness and fitness places in a, in a tough spot because a virtual class doesn't do the same thing and it's hard to police social distancing. And honestly, if you're sweating and breathing and huffing and puffing as you're working out, that's a pretty hard place to be, Ayanna. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, we seem to have lost Kevin because I think his audio and his video were a little bit choppy, but we're in the last few minutes. I'm going to um, just ask uh, Lynn and Shelly if you have a moment or two to um, last thoughts, uh, wisdom that you would impart to other business owners who are trying to figure out what to do in all of this. Shelly, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think during this time, it really is important to always keep in mind, what's your why? Why are you doing it? What's the mission? You know, with, with it, Eddie for All, there are some decisions that we have to make. There are times where I just got an email the other day from somebody living in Arizona that's interested in the accelerator. And it's so tempting if we have the room to say, sure, hop on into one of these programs. However, our funding and really our mission is to focus on the communities that we're in. And so even though we technically can do it, we kind of have to keep in check. But we also can't just think of how do you take this event or thing and just put it on this other platform? So, you know, I, I used to attend a comedy night every Monday, which I loved. They're now doing that virtual, but instead of having stand up, they now do it more like a talk show. And I think there are times that you, you have to shift. So it's like keeping within the core of what you do and what you're good at and not going too far outside of that. 
but also not just trying to duplicate things to that exact. And Ayana, what you're saying is, is so, I mean, I, for me, I mean, I used to love just going to the gym and having the equipment there. And so now what I'm doing is I am working with a trainer. They, I, through an app, I, I do my things, but it's like an accountability check-in. And I think when it comes to that type of fitness, it is figuring out what works for other people. For me, I don't want to be on the virtual class. I'd rather do it at my own time, but having that sort of check-in. So I think it's, it's kind of stepping back and figuring out the need that people have again, sticking through your core, but like, how can you adjust it slightly to make it work a little better? So that's a, the pivot, I guess. Um, yeah. Right. Which we've talked about on a couple of these webinars before. Um, I will say that next week's topic is about regaining your momentum for jump starting a restart on your business. And so hopefully we'll talk about some of that with our, our guest speakers as well. Lynn, do you have any parting thoughts you want to share about gathering in a post COVID world? Yeah, I think, um, you know, kind of piggybacking on Shelly was saying, for us, um, what is most important for, for us has been staying true to us, making decisions that are good for our business, um, and not looking at what others are doing and saying, gosh, we need to do that because our competitor is. Um, so kind of making sure that you are doing what makes sense for your business um, and what makes sense for, for what your platform is. Um, I think gatherings are going to evolve. They are going to change. It's going to look different. Um, it doesn't mean that that new picture is the right picture for you. So go with your evolution and be okay to evolve as a company, especially for so many who are of entrepreneurs who are what I call in the infant stage of your business, your business very much may look differently a year from now and that's okay. As long as you are staying true to what you feel is in the best interest of your intention and your business. That's, I think that's the, you know, the groundwork of what I can tell you. <laughs> that's great advice, Lynn. And I think that goes back to understanding the product market fit, uh, uh, match and it might be different in a post COVID world. I mean, I'm hoping there's something that's literally post COVID that feels a lot like before that's the, after the vaccine and everyone is, and we can go back to that. But right now, the vision that we have for what the future is, it's gonna be different than it was before. And I don't think, that in the next 12 to 18 months, and you know, I have no crystal ball, but even if they came up with the vaccine today before everyone had it and there was immunity, it would be a year. So from now till then, there's going to be a different world and it may require adjusting what your business looks like. Kevin, do you have any other final remarks you want to share? Yeah, I think this is, we all talked about these are unprecedented times, which nobody had predicted. And so it's testing all of us. And I think we all have to look at this as a Way of how do you continue to, to achieve the mission that you're trying to accomplish in a way that's uh, safe uh, for your team, uh, but also impactful and safe for the community you're trying to serve. Uh, you probably have all used this term that in difficult times, great companies take the opportunities to look at think how you might reimagine yourself. Uh, so that you have to do some reimagining about what you're going to be doing short, really short term, which we're going through now, medium term as we go to like the phase two and three. And then kind of the longer term, which would be kind of post-vaccine, but still going to be somewhat impacted. So take some time to think about how you might do that. Uh, I think we've all done a lot of you know, virtual video stuff. So how you might integrate that into your programming. But we know that in-person meetings, workshops, gatherings, uh, networking events are very important. So how you might be able to work those in a safer environment going forward, including things like uh, maybe social distancing to start with and maybe a little bit reduced in the future, but checking everybody's health. So just take the time, rethink how you might reimagine your business going forward to support their short, medium, and then longer term act activities. And it really tests everybody's adaptability and stay healthy yourself. Now, the worst thing you can do is like wear yourself down so you become unhealthy because that means you're not able to lead your teams and you're not able to impactfully interact with your community. Excellent advice. I don't even have anything to add from that other than I want to thank Lynn 
I want to thank Shelly. I want to thank Kevin. I want to thank Casey for running this webinar for us. All of you for joining us. We do this every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Next week's topic, how do I get my business momentum going again? And we would love to see you. The recording link uh, Casey just posted will be up here as well as the um, sign up for next week. So I thank you all. It's noon. I really appreciate your time. And I hope to see you all in person again sometime. <laughs> thank you all. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.